Welcome to First Bite, our Detroit Lions interview podcast. We are right in the middle of a free agent series, getting to know the newest Detroit Lions. We've learned about Cameron Sutton. We've learned about David Montgomery. Today's episode, we are learning about maybe the most, the biggest surprise signing. It was apparently the biggest surprise to both Brad Holmes and Dan Campbell. Uh, defensive back, we'll call him, C.J. Gardner-Johnson. My name is Jeremy Reisman. I'm the producer over at Pride of Detroit. You can find me at Detroit Online. With me, as always, for First Bite, uh, he is the senior editor of Pride of Detroit. He is Ryan underscore P.O.D. on Twitter. He is Ryan Matthews. Clap, clap, clap. Wow, what, what, a, uh, what a professional introduction. <laughs> you know who also was surprised with C.J. Gardner-Johnson signing? Uh, Brad Holmes' immediate family. True. So don't don't leave them out of the equation. <laughs> that's that's true. They were uh, awoken from their slumber at a, at approximately ten thirty p.m. on a on a Sunday night. Um, but yeah, uh, Lions fans were surprised, and we're gonna see if our guest was surprised. Uh, we want to learn more about C.J. Gardner Johnson. So we brought uh, one of our our favorite guests, a recurring guest, returning champion. Let's call him uh, Eagles beat writer, editor in chief over at Bleeding Green Nation at Brandon Gowden. On Twitter, it's Brandon Lee Gowton. How are you doing, buddy? I feel like you didn't mean to take a shot at me with the returning champion thing as a Super Bowl loss uh, <laughs> oh, shot, but uh, it did it did function as that a little <laughs> bit. But uh, no, I'm always glad to be here with you guys. It's always a great time. Yeah, well, let's let's jump right into it um, because, uh, like I said, Lions fans were pretty surprised and ecstatic about the signing. Uh, I, I certainly know what some Eagles fans immediately thought once it happened, but uh, what was your immediate reaction when when the Lions inked that deal? Yeah, I mean, I thought there was a chance that uh, C.J. Gardner-Johnson, C.J. G.J. is what I call him, um, uh, would return to Philly from a standpoint of, oh, oh, he's not getting a deal that he wants out, out there. The longer he's on the market, it would kind of indicate that, okay, maybe his best option is to come back to Philly on a cheap deal. Um, so when he gets one instead with the Lions, the instant reaction is like, huh, well, why wouldn't the Eagles be able to resign him to that? And I think it quickly uh, pivoted to, okay, maybe there was a feeling of he was disrespected in some way or 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 felt like, why would I resign that kind of prove it deal with the Eagles um, when I was just there? I thought maybe I kind of need to go elsewhere to make more money. So um, I definitely uh, <clears throat> had set the table for uh, expectations on the BGN radio podcast saying like, I didn't think Chauncey Garner Johnson was going to be back and I was not uh, torn up about him leaving it would be a bummer but I was not like oh this is a, a devastating kind of move for him to to exit um but I my for my impression from the Lions perspective was I think the Lions got a good player well to the best of your recollection Brandon because I know that you've probably put this in the past much like you have uh the the Super Bowl <laughs> that the Eagles just lost um <laughs> Sorry, um, just one shot from a it's, team that hasn't even it, sniffed a Super Bowl in my it's lifetime. It's deserved. It happened. No, it's it's cool. But it, all right, whatever. So, anyways, uh, to the best of your recollection, can you like get us caught up to speed on like what that mm -hmm. timeline was for yep. the you know CJ Gardner Johnson the negotiations with Philly? Like, I we, we kind of saw like in the immediate aftermath once the Lions signed him, there were some people you know uh, insiders that were coming out saying like oh like this this and this happened and this is why he didn't sign back. like what what is your understanding of the situation and and why do you think the the Eagles ultimately um, didn't match or bring him back? So originally before even um, the franchise tag window closed, there was a report out there that the Eagles would franchise tag him if they couldn't get a deal done. And that was clearly false because the Eagles did not do that and they almost never used the franchise tag. Um, and then around that time, not too long after that, I think Chauncey Gardner Johnson posted a video on like Twitter and Instagram and every social media uh, medium that he has, like goodbye Philly, basically is what he heard. Thank you Philly. So I was like, okay, he's probably going to leave. You know, my thought at the time, he's just going to get a big deal in free agency that the Eagles aren't going to be able to match. You know, for as much as people don't want to say the salary cap is real, uh, it is, and the Eagles were in a position where they were just going to lose a ton of players this off season because you can't keep everyone when everyone is like really, really good and you only have so much cap space to spend. And by the way, you have a Jalen Hurts contract coming down the pipeline. So, um, you know, I didn't, I was not shocked that he left. I think there was a misconception um, between maybe fans who thought CJ GJ was like this foundational player that the team was definitely going to keep. And some others, maybe among myself who like saw this as a player, they would like to keep at a certain number. And I think that's what played out. They entered negotiations with him early in free agency the rumors are that um, he they offered him like uh, three years for twenty four million, eight million a year, um, and uh, clearly Chauncey Gardner Johnson, who at one point 
in early in that week in free agency had posting some posted something to the effect on his Instagram story of like he could have had 12 interceptions last year if he didn't get hurt, <laughs> which kind of like fueled my belief at the time that maybe he isn't being super realistic about his value relative to what the market <laughs> thinks he's worth. And certainly um, if he was one of these free agents that had to be had, then he would have gotten a deal really early in free agency. The Eagles clearly weren't willing to lend him a blank check. And I think that was fair um, all along and correct in terms of how the market played out. They didn't need to rush to sign him if he was able, eventually available to sign with what the Lions got him for. Um, so the, the way the Eagles looked at it is that, um, okay, we can't really find a middle ground here. We have to pivot. It's not, you can't, you can't just keep waiting for that price to go down. Like, cause James Bradbury, who's a very good player and a free agent also, he's out there and he's talking to teams. It's like, well, if, if we wait too long, we might lose him. So they signed James Bradbury. They bring back Darius Slay, um, who you guys are familiar with, uh, and give him an extension. And I think at that point, um, the company line, at least, is like there there weren't the money wasn't there necessarily for Chauncey Gardner Johnson at that point. Before we move on to him as a player, I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, first of all, the, the three year, twenty four million dollar deal, because after after he signs with the Lions, their his agent goes out and and throws mm. up that that tweet. Not a good of, look. Yeah, which is very weird and very uh, strange. But it, it, the the argument there was the I, I think was it the same terms that you just said that they tweeted, but it was all backloaded, like it was all year but, three that he probably wouldn't see it or something like that. Yeah, but like smart salary cap people that I follow said that wouldn't even be like real. And also, that's not first of all, it's not a deal that Eagles do. That's not how they do their contracts in general. Mm -hmm. And two, like I forget why exactly, but like the the balancing of those numbers would not have been like permitted basically. So that <laughs> it just wasn't a real thing. Fair enough. Uh, I, it, it, it did seem a little weird and borderline scummy for an agency to even throw contract terms like that out. Cause I don't think I've ever seen that. Um, but the, the other part of the equation there is, is like you said, they, they use that money or maybe you don't see it that way. Maybe you do see it that way. They use the money that maybe they would have spent on CJ Gardner Johnson on extending Darius Slay on bringing back James Bradbury. Do you think that was the right move? I think it was in the sense that I never thought it made sense to give a blank check to uh, Chauncey Gardner Johnson because you're paying for his 99 percentile season. This is the I think it's insane. Like CJ Gardner Johnson and his agency, they both deserve blame. Like they botched this really badly. How how can he possibly hit the market harder next year coming off a year where he led the NFL in interceptions and like went to the Super Bowl? Like how, how is he going to get better than that next year? Like I just. I, I really struggle to think that he's going to find a more favorable long-term deal next year, unless, you know, maybe he goes to the Lions, he has another great year, they feel more comfortable about extending him. But still, I just don't think that's, like, really the best situation to land on. Um, you know, again, I thought he was great last season, but I don't think that's the norm as much as, like, that is probably his career season. That's the best season you're going to get out of him. Jamal Williams vibes, right, Ryan? <laughs> A lot. <laughs> yeah. Big, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, to say the least. So, uh, well, so... Let, let's let's kind of zero in on um, some of the, I guess, like um, the peripherals on CJ Gardner Johnson, because I, I think that there's this conception out there, Brandon, that uh, there are like, quote unquote, character concerns with with uh, with CJ GJ. Like, do you do you buy into any of that? Do you feel like it's limited to like his play style and his demeanor on the field? Or do you think that he can borderline on being a distraction? Um, I think some of that gets overblown. I don't think it's like coming out of nowhere, though. You know what I mean? At the same time, I don't think that just gets said totally as like to kind of cover up why the Eagles didn't sign him. And actually, it's OK that he left. Um, it's very evident that he and when it, just from a contract perspective, he entered negotiations with two different teams, the Saints, which is why they ended up trading him to the Eagles, then the Eagles and both teams were like, thanks, but no thanks. Because, again, I think part of what makes Chauncey Gardner Johnson great is his confidence, overconfidence even, if you will. Um, that's, I think, a lot of cornerbacks, really kind of in defensive backs in general, NFL players as a whole, kind of need that to succeed in some ways. But I think it gets to the point where it might be a little too far, again, in these negotiations, and why you kind of struggle to see why he might be a long-term player if you're not able to get him on a deal that really kind of matches with what he's worth and what he thinks he's worth. Um, you know, I, I'm not worried about him being like a distraction or anything like that in the locker room, as much as... I do think um, there could be some validity to and things I had heard about, like, you know, he has to be managed in some ways that maybe he's a little bit more high maintenance than some other players in that regard. I also think about, um, you know, how do things go uh, if 
you know, when things go wrong, like if there's a losing streak or the, the season's going poorly. And obviously there's bigger issues than him at that point, if the season's in that point. But you have to you have to wonder about that. There's obviously the point where um, he got in a fight or allegedly reportedly uh, in New Orleans. I think it was with Mike Thomas in practice. Um, so, you know, there, there are definitely some things there where uh, I think, again, there has to be some kind of managing, but that's part of why, you know, you have coaches and a strong locker room and all that stuff. Like that's the stuff you kind of try to figure out. Right. And obviously I'd probably, I'd probably try to fight Michael Thomas too. <laughs> um, but uh, to, to that point though, Jeremy, like, don't you think, and I think you're about to say this, but like, don't you feel like Detroit is just the right situation where if a guy needs a little TLC and extra attention, you have a guy like Aaron Glenn on staff who, has a history with him is, is a father right. figure to him as right. he had mentioned um yeah i think i think that should mitigate most issues i would imagine but like you said you never know when when turbulence hits how everyone's going to react what what i found really interesting was during his press conference his introductory press conference he talked about taking the next step as a person and a teammate not mm. he, he said like i'm good with where, with where i'm at as a player i want to be a better teammate i want to be a better leader on the team have you seen any of those qualities in him to, to show that maybe he could be a locker room leader? I'm speculating here, but maybe some of that is a reflection of him like realizing his market wasn't what it wanted to be. And whether it's fair or not, that, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it is true that teams clearly have some questions in yeah. that regard. Um, so, yeah, I do. Th I think maybe that is a, a point of self-reflection at that point. Um, yeah, again, I don't, I don't see anything that kind of prohibits, maybe he's, he's outspoken. Um, I don't think like, from my, my interactions and my experience, he's like always a jerk or anything, but I think again, uh, sometimes some people, you know, take things differently and I, I think he's a big personality. Some people like that. Some people gravitate to that. Some people don't, some people get turned off by that. So, um, I don't think I see anything prohibit him, prohibiting him from kind of becoming, you know, a leader and stepping up in that regard. Um, especially as he gets older, you know, he's maturing and everything. And, and like you said, in, a, in an environment where there's a support system, I think, and there is stability. Yeah, I could see that. So, so what do you think, where do you think he's best deployed on defense, Brandon? Like you got a chance to see him in Philly and like, I mean, he did play quite a bit in the slot, but primarily, I mean, he, he's playing a lot of safety in Philadelphia. Um, do you, do you think that there is an edge to putting him in one spot over the other? Or do you think that he's just kind of like, this thing that the NFL is kind of in love with when it comes to defensive backs and it's the versatility and, you know, disguising coverages and things like that. Yeah. So my good friend, Shil Kapadia from the ringer, I think the way he put it is um, what you, and part of why he didn't get a deal, why Tonsi didn't get a deal is because I think there's still a projection there at safety. And I think you're, you're paying for him uh, a big money contract. If he got one with the, the thought that he can still, he is younger, he can get better. He can improve at safety. I don't think he was like an elite safety last year and he showed good potential there. Uh, I think he has established himself more as a nickel cornerback. He only really played there. I think in like week 18, the regular season finale because Avante Maddox was out. He had a really good slot corner um, Avante Maddox um, from Detroit. And, and and has like a Red Wings tattoo and I think a Lions tattoo too. Um, but uh, so there was no need for him to play in the slot with Maddox there. Uh, I, I think if I had my choice, I'd rather see Chauncey Gardner Johnson in the slot, but I think he can play safety. It's just about, um, you know, transitioning to that spot because think about it. I mean, the Eagles traded for him like, I don't know, days before the regular season and he didn't really have time. And that's a, that's a big testament to him, by the way, the fact that he didn't have that time in the off season to learn a whole new position as much as he was doing it on the fly and still had good success at, at doing it again, I wouldn't say elite. Um, uh, but yeah, I, 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 I would rather see him in the slot, but he's versatile. Again, that's another big reason why he's so good. Like he can play in a lot of different roles. He can play in the box. He can play free safety. He can play in the slot. He can do a lot of different things. Yeah, and I found it interesting. Brad Holmes, when he was talking about C.J. Gardner-Johnson this week, referred to him as a safety pr predominantly. Like, he mentioned the versatility, mentioned that he can play nickel, but it felt like every time he talked about him, he was talking about him as a mm. safety, which doesn't really seem to mesh with where the lines are going to play him, and, and maybe, mm. I mean, I think I think they're going to be mixed. But I, I want to talk about him more as a nickel, because that's where he played when he was being coached by Aaron Glenn in, in New Orleans. So what what is his skill set like what what makes him a good nickel corner is he physical is he is he better man zone press off like what what's what's his skill set 
Yes. <laughs> I think the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, he's, he's physical. Um, he's not afraid to get up in someone's face. I also think he's really athletic. Um, he can do a lot of different things. I think at the end of the day, it's not an accident that uh, the ball production that he has in terms of passes, defense, and interceptions, like that's not coming out of nowhere. He clearly knows how to make plays on the ball. Um, now, I think his interception last, total last year is not like what you're going to see every year. I mean, that's that's I don't think it's a bold statement. It's it's tough to lead the league in interceptions on a yearly basis. Um, and he had six last year. And some of those were interesting because I think some of those were clearly great plays by him. And there's something to be said for defensive players who can actually catch the ball. Uh, the Eagles once had this player named Nigel Bradham who he'd be in position to make interceptions, ball would hit his hands, could never catch it. Um, so there's something to be said for that. At the same time, um, you get to six like he did in part because there's some fortuitous nature there where uh, – ball bounces off a linebacker's hands and right into his. And again, I credit him for making the play that came to him. Uh, but I also think sometimes there was just right place, right time. Uh, but, but some of that is a skill and some of that was just fortune last year. We have, we have a guy like that. Uh, his, his name was Nevin Lawson. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and he finally got an interception after he, he left it right. <laughs> um, just one. <laughs> yeah. But just like, it, it was always just incredible to watch him. Like he'd be like maintaining phase. He'd be step for step with the wide receiver and then just, miss the ball or not be looking or yeah. So, um, well, speaking of deficiencies and speaking of things that players struggled with, if you can talk a little bit about maybe why you as an Eagles fan are comfortable with letting the team move on from him, because maybe he struggles in X, Y, or Z area. Yeah. I just, again, I don't, I didn't think it was a player like in a perfect world, no salary cap, whatever. Yeah. You, you easily resign him. No doubt about it. But in a world where there is one and you have to kind of be judicious about how you spend your resources, I just didn't think he was the kind of player you hand a blank check to. I feel like he had the potential to be a player who, you know, you see these big deals at the beginning of free agency every year. And some of those teams, it works out for him. Uh, some other teams, it's like, oh, man, that's a really bad contract in a couple of years. And I just thought there was some buyer beware with him because, you're again, you're paying for that 99 percentile best season that he had. And I still think he's going to be a good player. But I don't know if he's going to be, you know, like kind of all pro elite kind of player, which was the money he seemed to be looking for. So um, I'm OK with it in that regard in the in the valuation um, from an Eagles roster standpoint. It's not easy because they don't they lost Marcus Epps, their other starting safety. And they don't really have, like, amazing in-house options. I'm optimistic about uh, Reed Blankenship, who picked off Aaron Rodgers. He became the first UDFA to ever pick off Aaron Rodgers uh, last year. He showed potential. And he was just signed Terrell Edmonds uh, on the cheap for, I think, only, like, 600K guaranteed. And he's a solid player. Um, so, you know, uh, is Chauncey Garner Johnson better than Terrell Edmonds? Yes. But I think when you look at the value, I think I like the value of that signing a little bit better. Um, but again, I think for you guys, like, so if we, if we put it in this way, like, I, I don't think that Chauncey Gardner Johnson returning to the Eagles made the most sense for the Eagles, but I do think in your situation, I think this is like a perfect fit for the Lions. Well, we'll skip to to the last part then right away. And then we'll, we'll backtrack and ask some other questions. What, what do you grade this signing? I mean, you, you say it's a good fit for the Lions. They got him for one year, six and a half million. I believe that's all guaranteed and it can be up to 8 million based on incentives. So in terms of value, in terms of fit, in terms of the, the talent that they're getting, how would you grade this free agency signing? And I don't, I don't know if you're one of those guys that hates grading, but I'm going to, I'm going to hold your no, feet to the on. fire here. Yeah. I mean, it's all, everything's made up. doesn't matter. We sure. can just say anything. Okay, um, right. you, you work for SB nation. You know how to create content. Go. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I think I'm going to give it an A minus. Um, I think, you know, again, the, the long-term value, I question, uh, it doesn't have to be a long, it's a one year right. deal. I, I don't know that, uh, he will be a long-term piece for the Lions. Again, I have questions about that because of how he values himself. But the potential for that is there. You know, you give him a year, you see if things can work out. And I think he's going to be a good player for you guys. You know, I think the interception production, again, is going to drop down from sure. six to I mean, two or three. I think that's what he kind of is. And I think he's going to be a good defensive player. Um, he was pretty durable other than the one point where he got uh, took a huge hit and had a lacerated kidney, that's so that's right. pretty serious. Yeah. Um, and credit to him for coming back like like a month after, not not too too long uh, of a, of a stretch that he missed there. So versatile um, age, I think. Again, with the situation that you guys brought up with Aaron Glenn, I think that's important because 
teams, again, clearly had some questions maybe about how he'd fit in their locker room and the locker room that you guys have under Dan Campbell. So I think this is a really good, exciting signing for you guys. While also, So that's the thing I think people might struggle with. It's like, okay, this is a good signing for the Lions, but it's okay that the Eagles let him walk. You know what I mean? It's not like yeah. I think some people would look at it like, well, it has to be a disaster if the Lions are getting a good signing. That's not how I see it. I think both teams did okay here. I feel like that used to be the narrative for every lion signing for quite some time. <laughs> right. um, like if, if, if it was Trey flowers or if it was Justin Coleman or if it was Rick Wagner, it didn't matter. It was like, Oh man, that guy wouldn't got a bag from Detroit. Nobody would have signed him to that. <laughs> um, but uh, on a, on a, on a high note, let's, let's, let's close things out on, on a couple of high notes here. My, my last question for you, Brandon is um, outside of fortuitous bounces, which I'm sure you're going to set aside, like give us a play from, and I know it's a brief time, that he spends in Philly, but like, give us a play that's like, so very CJ GJ. Like what mm. is a play that you can say, like that guy makes that play. And that's why he's better than X, Y, and Z player behind him at his position. That's a good question. And I feel like I've erased some of the 2022 Eagles in my mind <laughs> from the standpoint of having to separate. Fair. Fair. Um, one, one play that does jump to mind is he had this big interception at the end of the Texans game, which is like a little bit of an uncomfortable game for the Eagles for a bit especially given how bad the Texans were at the time. And I think the Eagles were still undefeated. Um, and uh, it was like, it could have gotten testy at the end, but CJ GJ made this really good uh, diving pick. And I, I forget another in another game too, where I think maybe it was against the Cowboys where um, Cooper rushed just through like an awful pass, um, but he made it like a crazy diving uh, catch. Like, you know, it's almost like a wide receiver out there on some of these interceptions. He, he again, he is, he definitely has ball skills. And I think there probably is something to be said for his ability to get his eyes on the ball, as opposed to Nevin Lawson, maybe who isn't, like, <laughs> has no idea where the ball is in the air. Um, so yeah, I, he just makes plays, man. And he, and the Super Bowl even, I, I just forgot about that. The Super Bowl, he, he had a big hit on, I think it was Pacheco and actually got fined for it originally, but then he appealed it. Um, and then he didn't get fined. So he, he can he can also lay the wood. And he's not afraid to mix it up and, and put a big hit in there. So um, I wish him all the best for you guys. Uh, last one for me, uh, and 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 it's good taking us back to off field stuff. Is there is there any good off off field stuff that he's done maybe in the community or, or maybe just running into him? I know I know he's maybe a little abrasive with the media, but um, and any personal off field stories that that Lions fans should know about CJ GJ. I definitely think, you know, when things are good, the team's winning. I think he can help add to that fun vibe. Um, there was, for a while there, uh, I think he, he changed his Twitter picture to Nick Sirianni, like, wearing a chain. And I don't remember if he put the chain on Sirianni, but, like, you know, he likes to have fun. And yeah. he likes to celebrate. Um, so, you know, when things are going good, I think he can kind of be vocal and fun. And uh, I remember when the Eagles first traded for him, there was a picture of him in like the SB Nation photo editor of him kicking the Atlanta Falcons logo. So like, you know, I, I think he could do something fun like that for the Lions this year. Maybe he, um, you know, puts the cheese head on like Sauce Gardner did uh, when the Jets beat the Packers last year. You know, I, I could see him kind of, you know, he's going to be a fan favorite. I think that's what is the real takeaway yeah. here. Um, as long as he, you know, doesn't, you know, fall off a cliff production wise, I think people are going to like him a lot. Adopt that villain mentality, right, Ryan? Just start selling the sweatshirts, you know, <laughs> like, I feel like it's such a missed opportunity. You're, 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 you're supposedly packing up and leaving Allen park. Don't you need some coin to pay those movers? <laughs> uh, maybe we'll see. Uh, Brandon, before we let you go, I also want to give you a, a an opportunity here to, to plug your stuff. Um, I'm sure, um, most people probably know you because you're, you're a staple here at SB nation, but, uh, but give, uh, I'll give you a couple seconds, minutes, whatever, whatever it takes. Uh, couple to hours. You, yeah, if you want a couple hours, you got it. Staple away, Mr. Stapler. <laughs> <laughs> um, BleedingGreenNation.com is obviously where you can check out the website equivalent of PrideOfDetroit.com. Uh, Bleeding Green Nation uh, also on the podcast. Anywhere you get a podcast, we got the BGN Radio Show, which I do a couple, like once or twice a week with Jimmy Kemsky. Um, and then I do the NFC East Mixtape Podcast, which I co-host with RJ Ochoa who Jeremy talks to on the SB Nation NFL show. How about this? The layer, the connection, the segue of plugs here. Um, so check out the SB Nation NFL show as well. And then I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Brandon Gelton. And I'm also on Cameo, which is really and That's right, the Cameo. But if you want a Cameo, you can book me on Cameo. Nick Nick the Greek booked you, didn't he? <laughs> he to uh, talk about he, Matt Patricia? Probably, yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but uh, we we don't we don't bring up the the SB Nation podcast here. It's, someone feels like I'm cheating on them. Wow, 
Yeah. But uh, Brandon, <laughs> thank you so much for joining <laughs> us, man. Appreciate the honest and 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 thorough insight for for CJ Gardner Johnson, a player who uh, I I hear that you actually secretly miss entirely. So. Uh, appreciate the insight uh, appreciate you all for listening we got one more of these left uh, assuming that the lines don't have a big signing around the corner uh, we're going to be talking with matt mayoko about emmanuel mosley coming up very soon so stay tuned for that but until then until next time thank you for listening it's chaos be kind